I'm heading out across Britain to find the history embedded in the landscape. This is a country where you're never very far from an ancient routeway, a glimpse of lost industry, or a grand monument from our past. So from coastal paths to hilltop tracks, I've started doing some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me to a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. I'm in sleepy North Norfolk for this walk, exploring a famously quiet coastline. But in Victorian times, this area seemed set to change. Royal patronage, celebrity visitors, a host of railway lines, and some very fine sea bathing, all made this the place to be. So how on earth did North Norfolk remain such a celebrated backwater? Just here, I'm only 100 miles from London, yet I'm in one of the quietest corners of England. And it's fantastic walking territory. One of the things I love so much about Norfolk is that you don't often come here unless you're going to come here, if you see what I mean. It's not on the way to anywhere. It's an edge, a periphery. And so much of what it is is defined by those characteristics. In our unique British way, we've come to celebrate the fact that this area is, well, a little bit backward. Simply the best of uh, We're asking you to tell us who is simply the best person Norfolk has ever produced. Where else could Alan Partridge hail from except North Norfolk? But something very dramatic happened here during the long reign of Queen Victoria. Her son, the Prince of Wales, arrived in the county, accompanied by a succession of railway lines. This area was in danger of becoming trendy. So I've come to find out how the Victorian gentry managed to keep North Norfolk in a perfect state to become the natural home for Alan Partridge. My four-day route starts beside the wash at the Queen's private residence, Sandringham. So different from its coastal neighbour, the experimental seaside resort of Hunstanton. Day two, and I'm crossing ancient agricultural land. Much of it still dominated by the county's largest estate, Hokham. Further east, and it's the coast that's of interest, at the Victorian-inspired nature reserve of Blakeney. Finally, steam power will help carry me to Cromer, the Victorian resort that became a battleground for the heart and soul of North Norfolk. But that's 35 miles and four days east. I'm starting at a royal residence that threatened to kickstart a Norfolk awakening. Sandringham House. In 1861, Queen Victoria and her husband Albert were searching for a property for their wayward son Bertie, the future Edward VII. That summer, the 19-year-old prince had been on an army camp in Ireland, but managed to spend three nights with a young actress. Victoria claimed the incident so appalled her husband that it killed him. So when this remote country estate came on the market the following year, the now-widowed Victoria snapped it up for the equivalent of £22 million in today's money. <laughs> to find out if North Norfolk tamed Bertie, I'm meeting historian Dr Kate Williams. Queen Victoria, she loved the idea of the healthy body and the healthy mind. That was Prince Albert's mantra. And that was quite a modern thing, wasn't it? It was a very modern thing, very German thing. Of yeah. course, Prince Albert was just dead, but they still... The idea of running around outside and keeping healthy and being in the country, Queen Victoria loved the idea of it. The Prince of Wales was a bit of a bad boy, wasn't he? What Queen Victoria wanted, the idea of her pushing him to get his country estate, was hopefully here he'd be away from all the glamour girls of London and be able to focus on his wife and family. But Victoria's plans didn't exactly work as she'd intended. In 1863, Edward married Princess Alexandra of Denmark. 
But this sheen of grown-up respectability masked a cavalcade of royal mistresses. Did any of the mistresses come here? Afraid they did, Tony. They came to the parties with their husbands and some of the other ones were kept outside in little cottages. So some of the mistresses were married? He had married mistresses because if you find a married mistress, you could cover up the evidence. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Bertie's ladies included actress Lily Langtry, French actress Sarah Bernhardt, French singer Hortense Schneider, the Countess of Warwick, Lady Randolph Churchill, mother of Sir Winston, and Alice Keppel, often referred to as the Prince's favourite. With its discreet location, Sandringham seemed to be the ideal cover for this sort of behaviour. Nonetheless, simply by being here, Bertie was opening the eyes of the nation to this corner of North Norfolk. People in the late Victorian era were urban dwellers, so increasingly the countryside wasn't what it was before, a place where you worked. It was a place for tourism, holidays became more popular throughout the leisured classes. Once the royals had purchased Sandringham, everyone wanted to come here. Royal spotting was an absolutely top popular hobby in the 19th century, so it really gave the area a huge boost. <laughs> Our passion for the royals today is stronger than ever. No matter how soggy it gets. <laughs> Our current Prince of Wales attends the Sandringham Flower Show every year. These days with Camilla, the great-granddaughter of none other than Alice Keppel, his great-grandfather's favourite mistress. Funny how things work out. Having soaked up the scandals of Victorian Sandringham, I'm setting off on my walk through the public areas of the modern estate. In the 1860s, access here would have been strictly limited. Space and privacy really were the point, because in addition to ladies, Bertie's other passion was shooting. Over his 50 years at Sandringham, more and more land was purchased. 7,000 acres of woodland were planted. Sandringham became the country's premier sporting terrain. Shooting would start each year on November the 9th, the future king's birthday, after which Bertie would use all available time to entertain the great and the good. A single day's shoot, it said, once accounted for 1,300 partridges. Edward even decreed that time itself should be altered to maximise enjoyment of the estate. This involved moving all the clocks here forward by half an hour in order to make the most of daylight hours in the winter months. He was bringing his own way of doing things to North Norfolk. And the most fashionable man in Britain was dead set on keeping development here to a minimum. Bertie, though, needed one cutting-edge bit of technology to make his dual life in London and Norfolk possible. Two miles west of Sandringham House, I'm stopping off at the Royal Railway Station. In 1846, a line from St Pancras to King's Lynn was completed. It was part of a transport explosion that saw Britain acquire 10,000 miles of track in the space of just 15 years. And as Bertie and his bride, Princess Alexandra, moved into Sandringham, the Lynn Hunstanton Railway Company were extending the line to the North Norfolk coast, right past their front door. It was practically their own private facility. 
the old station at Wolferton, about two miles from Sandringham, so near enough to be incredibly convenient and far away enough not to intrude. The trains may have long gone, but Wolferton Station remains fit for royalty. Thanks entirely to its railway enthusiast owner, Richard Brown. Richard, this station, when the, the Prince of Wales came here, did it look like this? More or less, yes. It's, uh, it's changed, of course, obviously, with no track, of course, now, and uh, that was the original building over there. That's the one with the uh, Prince of Wales feathers over the door. But presumably, uh, the Prince of Wales and Alexandra didn't just hang around on the platform reading the newspaper waiting for the train to arrive. No, they, they both had a hand in the design of this side yeah. with, the, with the Great Eastern Railway. At Wolferton, an entire station was built to keep the Prince and Princess of Wales happy. The lamp fittings came topped with crowns. The station buildings matched the Tudor style of the estate. Can we have a look? So this is, as it were, the royal waiting room? Yes, indeed. Wow! And inside, there were fixtures and fittings fit for a future king and queen to say nothing of all the VIPs who would also come through here. Bertie's nephews, for instance, Tsar Nicholas and Kaiser Wilhelm. And his nephews-in-law, the kings of Greece and Spain. All came through Wolferton on their way to stay at Sandringham. Thanks a lot, Richard. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. In 1862, the railway company must have been ecstatic. The little branch line they'd lobbied, campaigned and fundraised for was now going to service the most talked about spot in rural Britain. And heading north, I'll be sticking close to the old railway line for the rest of my day's walking. My final stretch inside the Sandringham estate takes me across Dursingham Bog. It's a rare chance to see what this land on the edge of the fens would have looked like centuries ago before forestry made its mark. Lowland heath like this, with its bed of acid peat, once littered the eastern shores of the Wash. Now a protected nature reserve, Dursingham Bog is home to insects galore the black darter dragonfly, and the odd walker. Bog conquered. And I can follow the old railway track bed for a while as I make my way to the coast and the line's ultimate destination, Hunstanton. Here at the very northwest tip of East Anglia, the line stretched beyond the royal estate straight into another massive Norfolk land holding, that of the Lestrange family. In the 1840s, two decades before Bertie arrived at Sandringham, the man in charge was Henry Stileman Lestrange. Artist, aristo and innovator. He took note of two things, the coming of the railways and the craze sweeping more developed parts of the country seaside holidays. Since the beginning of that century, seawater had been heralded as a wonder drug. Swimming in it could cure everything, from corns to cancer, it was claimed. South Coast settlements like Brighton, Weymouth and Eastbourne had been transformed into grand and profitable resorts. But here on grassy clifftops, where sheep had grazed for centuries, Lestrange conceived of a new style of coastal resort, one that was just a little bit more Norfolk. This is a copy of his uh, bird's eye view of the proposed sea bathing village near the old village of Hunstanton. Lestrange's design is like a Cotswold village. Always intended to be classy, there was to be no brash metropolis here. There were going to be between 60 and 80 little houses and a hotel, somewhere for people to bathe. It was a radical vision mapped out in 1846. 
But even then, Lestrange believed it would take a railway to make his resort village a reality. Problem was, there was no guarantee of any railway at that point. Initially, all that got built was uh, the new inn, which is what's now the Golden Lion Hotel there. Without a railway, this location was just too remote. Development ground to a halt, and the lonely hotel became known as Lestrange's Folly. But ten years later, there was a breakthrough. A concrete plan was laid out to extend the line from King's Lynn past Sandringham to this northwest tip of East Anglia. This is what Lestrange had waited for. He seized his chance and gave away stretches of his land for free to ensure the line got built. The first train rolled into the new Hunstanton in October 1862. But Lestrange sadly wasn't there. He died from a heart attack five weeks before the line opened, aged just 47. Lestrange was a pioneer and a visionary, and like so many of such people, after he died, other developers were able to pursue his dream. Although I'm not sure Lestrange would have been that enthusiastic about this bowling alley and the amusement arcade, are you? Or that row of shops over there. Not, not incredibly Lestrange, are they? The truth is, Sunny Honey, as it's affectionately known, grew and grew in a way Lestrange could never have imagined or wanted. The railway did bring people, loads of people. And whilst Hunstanton has never rivalled a Brighton or an Eastbourne, it was an early lesson for the great and good of Norfolk. The railways had the power to usher in major and unwelcome change. Tomorrow, though, I'm moving along the coast to explore how Lestrange's even wealthier neighbours did things rather differently. I've reached the northwest tip of Norfolk on my walk exploring how this area has remained one of the least populated stretches of modern England. Today I'm heading east and walking away from the Wash through an area that remains beautifully undeveloped. So why did this part of my walk never receive the sunny honey treatment? With a railway to support it, Hunstanton had become a rare outpost of local tourism by 1865. Today's walk, though, should prove just how rare a thing that was. Over 20 miles, I'll be crossing land that's been cultivated for centuries. As I head towards a farm that grew and grew into the county's largest and most powerful estate, Hokum. Four miles from Hunstanton, I've reached the rather lovely village of Thornham. This is just the kind of thing I was expecting from North Norfolk. Here's a nice little bit of history. In the year 1666, they were building that church tower there to fit on the end of the building. But then the Great Fire of London happened, so they had to stop because the construction team needed to go down to London in order to help in London's reconstruction. And they didn't finish it until later, quite a bit later, actually, in 1935. Well, that's got to be the longest builder's tea break in history. But in those three centuries, I doubt the look of this land had changed that much. A field of barley is still a field of barley. But one thing had changed, the land ownership. By the time Victoria reached the throne, nearly all North Norfolk's vast acres of fertile soil were in private hands conferring real power on those fortunate landowners. But I'm heading to Barrow Common, one of the few remaining patches of common land, where I've arranged to meet Tom Williamson, an expert in the history of Norfolk's landscape. So what happened to all the common land? When agriculture changes and modernises in the 18th century, um, most of it gets enclosed in various ways, often by, by parliamentary enclosure, and reallocated as private land. Farms are getting bigger, small farms are going to the wall. But for the rich, that is an invitation for them to create these wonderful new large places for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Once you've amassed property, through purchase, through enclosure, whatever, then you can start improving it, as they say. 
creating modern farms, creating a nice park and garden around your, your, your posh mansion. It's difficult to conceive in this day and age that until quite recently, millions of acres of our country weren't owned by anyone. There were simply rights allowing folk to grow crops and graze cattle. George III's Enclosure Act scrapped that, and they transformed rural areas like this, allowing landowners to take a modern industrial approach to farming. The Acts gave smart farmers the chance to become the oligarchs of the age. Here in Brancaster, there used to be one of the most perfect examples of the industrialisation of Norfolk agriculture. It was called the Brancaster Malt House, and it was absolutely massive. It was finished in 1797, and it used to run all the way down the far side of that lane there, about 100 metres, and it processed 120 tonnes of barley every week. And when they finished processing it, they used to bring it over here to Brancaster Stave, and Norfolk barley went all over the place. It went to Scotland to make the whisky, it went to Holland to make the beer, even went to Dublin to make the Guinness. So after the land enclosures, barley was grown, malted and shipped on a massive scale. This coastline was becoming highly profitable, without the slightest hint of a tourist. And on this north-facing coast, the geography simply didn't fit the tourist mould either. What the Victorians wanted was a clifftop walk or a nice sandy beach and a dip in the sea. But what you get in this part of North Norfolk is this, great swathes of tidal salt marsh. Longshore currents pushing tonnes of silt west towards the wash have created the muddy, ever-changing marshlands of North Norfolk. They now dominate the coastline for over 20 miles. And there's one product of that process I'm rather fond of. There's a lovely patch of it there. Samphire, or samphire as they call it, round here. When I was a kid, you wouldn't touch this with a barge pole, but now you can get it in all the swanky London restaurants at inflated prices. Just wash it through to get rid of the salt, cook it very, very lightly, add a bit of oil and vinegar and some pepper. Absolutely gorgeous. Fantastic. Well, the Victorians may not have been drawn to these salt marshes, but just east, the collection of villages known as the Burnhams did produce one thing the Victorians loved, a true hero. Burnham Thorpe was once home to one of England's finest. Horatio Nelson, who was born here in 1758, the son of a local rector. He didn't live long enough to be a Victorian. He died valiantly at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the scene of his greatest triumph. This son of Norfolk was revered by Victorian society, and about 250 pubs in Britain bear his name. But I'm stopping for lunch at the only one that was actually his local. After his first 17 years at sea, Nelson returned to his home village in 1787 and waited five whole years for his next commission. Plenty of time for a drink, you'd think. And we do know that he actually came here because it's recorded that in the year 1793, he threw a big dinner for the men of the village in order to celebrate the fact that he'd just taken command of the 64-gun Agamemnon. Is that for me? Thank you. Cheers. So, uh, I'm in good company, aren't I? Nelson would go on to become the national hero. But in North Norfolk, the biggest name by far was Nelson's neighbour, who was busy building an estate that to this day makes even Sandringham look a little pokey. Look at that avenue, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Just over two miles from Burnham Thorpe is the south entrance to Hokeham Hall. I'm uh, just there at the entrance to Hokeham Park. Hokeham Park's about 3,000 acres, all trees and grass. It's really 
very, very big with Hokum Hall in the middle of it. But that's just the start of the story because all the way round it, there's the Hokum Estate going right up to the sea and all the way round here. That is eight times as big as the park. Of all the great Norfolk estates that came together in time for the Victorian age, Hokum was the biggest and finest of the lot. It was controlled by the ultimate Norfolk farmer, Thomas William Cook, who just happened to be godfather to Henry Lestrange back in Hunstanton. Cook's utter dominance of this area was recognised in the form of a royal visit. A young Victoria came to stay with the man hailed as the greatest commoner in England. Why did she come? Well, I think Thomas William Cook was almost a legend within his own lifetime. He'd been an MP for nearly 50 years. She commented in her diary about what an old man he was, but yet how vigorous and um, lively he was. You'd think he was 30 years younger. She also commented on the fact that his wife, who in fact was his goddaughter, um, was 40 years younger than he was. <laughs> so he was. So that kept him vigorous, obviously. A mischievous guy. <laughs> With his international agricultural fairs, crop rotation techniques, 30,000 acres and dozens of tenant farmers paying him rent, Thomas William was the greatest beneficiary of land enclosures. He's still known simply as Cook of Norfolk. Not everybody was that impressed by him, were they? No, this was a very small, elitist group of very wealthy capitalist farmers. And, of course, under them were a huge number of very poor farm labourers. There was a lot of underemployment, a lot of unemployment. Wages were the lowest amongst agricultural workers any, anywhere in Britain. It would be harsh to blame Cook for the broad social ills of 19th century Norfolk but he's proved to be the key figure that shaped large parts of my walk today and indeed tomorrow too. Such was the extent of his estate. And as if his influence wasn't great enough, Queen Victoria made the ageing cook Earl of Leicester. In return, the new Earl of Leicester built a pub on the edge of his park in honour of his queen. But as Cook of Norfolk gave way to his son, so our old friend the railway arrived. It went between the enormous expanse of Holcombe Beach down there and Holcombe Village. So did that mean the estate was about to be swamped by tourists? I'm finding out how North Norfolk has remained so famously undeveloped. And so far, at least, a handful of powerful landowners have been the key. By the early Victorian age, life and business in this extremity of rural Norfolk were dominated by the Earls of Leicester and their power base at Hokum Hall. But even they couldn't escape the new age of industry and travel altogether. And in 1866, the railway came. This was the greatest farming estate in Norfolk. But in a county now made trendy by the royal family, could Hokum resist the railway age of mass tourism? In short, yes. And today, I'm hugging the coast to see how the Victorian age effectively killed off any chance of modern development ever happening. From Hokum Park, I'll be passing through the small port of Wells and on across more salt marshes to the famous nature reserve at Blakeney Point, a pristine conservation area born out of all things the Victorian love of hunting. Back on the edge of Hokum Park, the second Earl of Leicester was now adjusting to life with a railway. In 1866, the very first people to use the new line past Hokum were the Prince and Princess of Wales, paying a visit from Sandringham. Countryside pursuits were all the rage, and the second Earl of Leicester was great mates with Edward, Prince of Wales, and the two of them would go out with their guns and slaughter as many of God's creatures as they possibly could. And no amount of trains or holiday makers was going to be allowed to get in the way of that hallowed pursuit. But the second Earl wasn't anti the railway age. 
In fact, he invested heavily in the local network, just not for tourists, but for his barley. Yeah. Wells next to the sea was the key gateway where the estate's barley was malted and shipped out. We got maltings all the way around the town. There aren't so many now, but there were a dozen a hundred years ago here, and we were exporting half the exports of malt in the country. With the Earl of Leicester's backing, there wasn't just one, but two railway lines. Lines set to push the port and the maltings to a whole new level. But there's barely a glimmer of industry in Wells today. It's a charming little quayside where locals and visitors come crabbing as the tide comes in. But if it had two railways, why didn't Wells grow more? Wells was already busy before the railway came. And, uh, in fact, the railway made Wells quieter. Why? It, it, it actually put it into decline because it was so... Wells was built on, on exporting stuff and importing yeah. stuff. And it was easier to do it by rail than it was by boat. The railways were more effective than anyone could have imagined. They killed off the fortnightly packet boat service to London almost immediately. And as ships grew bigger and the North Norfolk silt grew deeper, Wells struggled to live up to its billing of major port. All of which has left the town in some kind of time warp. Just the sort of place that appeals enormously to 21st century visitors. <laughs> The next nine miles of my walk is a return to the world of the salt marsh. This unique ecosystem is fiercely protected. But 130 years ago, it certainly wasn't. And the abundance of bird life drew those gun-loving Victorians. Here on the Norfolk coast, the attraction was wildfowl. The gentlemen enjoyed the sport. The ladies liked the feathered hats. Above all, gentlemen gunners wanted to shoot here, the four-mile spit of land known as Blakeney Point. Hi. Hello. The quality and range of the wildlife found here was irresistible, but, as it turned out, dangerously fragile. Coastal ranger RJ Tagala has agreed to ferry me out to Blakeney Point. It was discovered in the Victorian times as a great place to come rarity hunting, shooting birds, which were later stuffed. When you say rarity hunting, what were they after? They had a, a motto of what's shot is history, what's missed is mystery. It was a learning process. In 1884, a couple of brothers from London travelled down and found a bird called the blue throat, a beautiful bird with um, blue markings. The shooting of one rare visitor to Britain turned this obscure shingle spit into a dream destination for the shooting fraternity of Britain. Strange as it may seem, these gents considered themselves lovers of nature. But without the barrel of a lens, they love nature via the barrel of a gun. Alongside the terns, gulls and oyster catchers, today, Blakeney, has some other famous residents. Is that what I think they are? It certainly is, yeah. Here we've got a mixture of grey and common seals on the end of the point. They're just as curious in us as I think uh, we are in them. They're so charming, aren't they? Mm. Look at that one kicking off up there. Look. <laughs> By the late 1800s, Mass slaughter by rarity hunters and wildfowlers was having a serious impact on wildlife stocks. At Blakeney, common turn numbers dropped by up to 90%. Oyster catchers disappeared altogether. If there were to be such things as rarities in the future, something would have to change. And it did. Blakeney Point became a standard bearer for a new national sentiment. Thanks a lot. Why do you think there was that great sea change between shooting wildlife and conserving wildlife? I think through having the opportunity to look at wildlife up close that they'd shot um, gave them a sense of sentimentality mm -hmm. because they were appreciating the beauty of these creatures yeah. and a realisation that they were taking their lives. In actual fact, these wonderful creatures deserve to be conserved. 
what about here? When did it stop just being a spit where you might take pot shots at seabirds and seals and started to be somewhere for the protection of wildlife? Well, in 1901, uh, the Cly and Blakeney Wild Bird Protection Society was set up. How did that and, happen? Uh, well, local wildfowlers um, decided that the breeding birds needed protected. A guy named Bob Pynchon became the first watcher out here, and he had been an assistant to these gunners and a wildfowler, and ended up working here protecting the birds. So he started off very much as uh, the Victorian, and then uh, ended up the modern man, as it were. Yeah, indeed, yes. <laughs> Modern conservation was a Victorian innovation. The RSPB and the National Trust, both creations of the late 1800s. The highest levels of society ditch their feathered hats in favor of flowers. And even Bertie back at Sandringham ended up patron of his local birds protection society. And this is where you live now? This is, yes. Wow, it is so fantastic. Everybody must be green with envy. The old Blakeney lifeboat station is home to RJ and two other National Trust rangers. 21st century versions of Bob Pynchon, the man who shot and then saved the wildlife of Blakeney. But what did this sudden empathy for wildlife mean for the long-term future of North Norfolk? Well, in 1910, the then landowner of Blakeney Point threatened to sell to a property developer, a thousand acres in total. The new conservationists were in uproar. So funds were raised, 695 pounds in all, to purchase the land for the new National Trust, their first coastal nature reserve. Conservation had become a new way of ensuring this coastline would never get developed. The tiny village of Cly next the sea is my destination this evening. Tomorrow, it's my final day's walking in Norfolk, a return to the railways and a visit to North Norfolk's one genuine Victorian resort. I've reached my final day exploring North Norfolk. From the Prince of Wales to the birth of the National Trust, I've seen how big players here in Victorian times helped keep Norfolk nicely detached from the modern industrial world. But no one, no matter how powerful they might be, could stem the rise of the British summer holiday. In 1871, holidays became a statutory right. It might not sound much, but the Bank Holidays Act gave us six days off a year. And the rail companies wasted no time marketing their destinations to a new mass audience. In the late Victorian times, it wasn't just the rich who were coming here. My final day's walking is leading me to the place which by 1900 had become the epitome of North Norfolk, at least as far as the holidaying masses were concerned. The nature reserves and salt marshes are behind me. And fittingly, it's steam power that will help me on my way today, before an afternoon stroll to the cliffs, villas and pier of Cromer. In national terms, the railways were, not surprisingly, rather late to arrive in this distant corner of East Anglia. But when they did, they made a big impact. And it's nice to find one that's still with us. The North Norfolk Railway has been entertaining steam enthusiasts along an old route to Cromer for nearly 50 years. But back in Victorian times, the line was intended to transform this part of the county. How old is this railway? 1887 was the year when it was completed through to Cromer. So it's quite late. Yes, indeed. Um, it was built, to, hopefully, to sell to the Midland Railway. Why did the railway men in the Midlands want to throw a spur out to North Norfolk? The idea of an east-west connection gets away from all the other railways being London-centric, and uh, 
opens the Midlands and the North up to wonderful holiday resorts. So it was very much a tourist line with tourist stations on it? Yes. Yeah, the, um, the industry was just beginning in late Victorian times and, and the idea was to take advantage of it. Pretty successful it was. They, they came during the summer, so much so that the profits made during the summer kept the railway running during the winter. For the railway companies, getting Londoners and Brummies to the Norfolk coast wasn't the end of the story. Once they were here, they aggressively marketed day trips. It was advertised as the Royal Route. Uh, from the Midlands. Later years, once the tourism was established, they, they would run you all round the system. On a Wednesday, they advertised the Sharaban tour of Sandringham. My dad always said sixpence to the person who sees the first sight of yeah. the sea. I don't think we ever were paid, but... <laughs> Today, the railway only stretches as far as Sheringham, where it's clear the line built to carry tourists is now a major attraction in its own right. I'm only passing through Sheringham, but it's easily the biggest settlement I've seen on my walk. If you look at those dates, they all postdate the arrival of the train. It's hard to believe that a relatively short time ago that was all fields, isn't it? So finally, I've found some real urban development in Victorian North Norfolk. But I'm heading on a further five and a half miles to my final destination. An intriguing coastal spot, because since the dawn of sea bathing fashion, it had been renowned for the purity of its waters. Chroma. There was a certain class of people who came here before the railways. There were the Gurneys, who were bankers from Norwich, the Barclays, bankers from London. These were ultra well heeled families who were following Prince Edward and Prince Albert and coming here to live the rural life with lots of fresh air. So unlike everywhere else on my walk, Cromer had a tourist platform to build on, albeit quite an exclusive one. And by 1887, it was the terminus of two railway lines. Londoners could be here in less than three hours. Cromer was set for an invasion from the trendy middle classes. I'm meeting Alistair Murphy of the Cromer Museum to find out what happened next. If you'd been here 100 years ago, there would have been hotels lining here and there would have been people in posh clothes people outside the hotels and there would have been carriages pulled up. If you were anyone in the 1890s, you had to have been to Cromer. Now you'd have to have been to Southeast Asia. Yeah. But in 1893, it was Cromer. This entire Westcliff area of town appeared in the last 10 years of Victoria's reign. At this time, the Empress of Austria and the German nobility came to stay. Prince of Wales Bertie was made patron of Royal Cromer Golf Club, although he much preferred hanging out at the Virginia Court Gentlemen's Club. And for the middle classes, there was Clement Scott, theatre critic of the Daily Telegraph. He came at the invitation of the railway company and penned a series of gushing travel reports. He named the area Poppyland, which quickly proved to be nothing short of a marketing triumph. The businessmen of Cromer, who were also the councillors, realised that they could make money out of the Poppyland brand. So a local chemist made the Poppyland bouquet, which was a perfume that ladies visiting the town would buy. And there was Poppyland China, which is very uh, sought after to this day. But not everything about Poppyland pleased its councillors. In 1897, the elderly gentlemen who ran the council, some of them were having apoplexy at council meetings, it's in the records, uh, at the prospect of men and women actually bathing together in the same area of beach. Prior to that, the women would have bathed in one part of the town and the men would have bathed in other parts. But from 1897 onwards, you could bathe with your partner as long as you were dressed in a costume from neck. 
As one of the first resorts to allow mixed sea bathing, visitor numbers grew and grew. And the decision was made to create an eye-catching centrepiece for Cromer's reinvention, a pleasure pier. They're all about promoting the place, aren't they? A statement of confidence. We're here to give you a really good time. Cromer Pier opened in 1901, the very end of the Victorian age. After almost 60 years of waiting, Bertie, Prince of Wales, was now Edward VII. And with its pier, memorabilia and mixed bathing, Cromer seemed to finally be leading Norfolk into the world of mass tourism. But looking back at Cromer, what strikes me is how small it is. It doesn't begin to compare with all the large Victorian resorts of the south and west coasts. In truth, Bertie's ten-year reign was as good as it got for tourism in Cromer. Poppy Land, with its mix of resort and rural, was the perfect brand for genteel Edwardian leisure. The Great War, though, changed British society forever. The resorts that went on to thrive now had to cope with millions of working families each year. Cromer was really quite happy with just a few thousand. Poppy Land simply slipped from the public's attention. And now, North Norfolk's railways have mostly gone. The nature reserves have grown, and the vast estates continue to farm, shoot, and shape the future of this coastline. But I'm not sorry, because if the entrepreneurs and developers had changed this coastline in the way they did elsewhere, I wouldn't have wanted to walk it. And Cromer may be small, but it is perfectly formed. On which note, it's almost time for the end of the pier show. <laughs> <laughs>